Um, so this isn't actually a technical talk. I've, I've given this talk before at a couple of hacker conferences, and so as a result, it's largely a comedy routine. Um, I didn't really tell Andrew this, so this is a surprise. Andrew's one of my colleagues. He may not actually be a colleague by the end of the talk, depending on how, uh, how this goes. Um, but yeah, uh, navel gazing with Docker. Um, what's the point of this talk? Basically, Docker 101. Can you all hear me okay as well? Awesome, cool. I wave my hands a lot, so I'm not using the microphone. Um, if you can't hear me, just wave. Um, that's the first of many Docker puns, or boat-related puns. Um, so, uh, Docker 102, some internals and security. Uh, I'll give you a quick demo, and most importantly, boatloads of puns. That's why I'm here. Um, so, who am I? Uh, previously, I was a JavaScript startup wielding hipster. Uh, I was a pen tester and security engineer. Now, I'm a security tinkerer at ThoughtWorks. Uh, the photo is an in-joke, which makes absolutely no sense in this context. I should explain as well, this talk was given previously at a hackathon, as I said, it was a 45-minute time slot, and against all common sense, I decided to condense this 45-minute talk into 30 minutes, so it will be quite fast, um, if it makes no sense at all. Uh, but first, I want to find out some stuff about you. So who in the audience is a landlubber? You've never used Docker before. Give me a big yar. 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 All right, cool. <laughs> Excellent. All right, sweet. Who in the audience uh, has just found your seed legs? You've maybe used Docker once or twice, but you're not super confident on it. Give me a big yar. Yar. Okay, cool. About even. All right, sweet. Who here is a salty seed dog? You've used Docker extensively, using it in production, use it everywhere. Give me a big yar. Yar. Oh, less. Okay, right. Um, and then who is here to just heckle me and make fun of this? Wow, okay. So at security cons, yar, 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 yar for whoever's here to heckle. But anyway, great. I love that you're so much more supportive. Um, so finally, the purpose of this talk uh, is, to, is a crash course on everything Docker. The less you laugh at my puns, the more I tell them. Um, so the crash course on everything Docker will highlight a few things for attack and defense. I'm a security guy, as I said, um, so that's usually the, the event that I look on this stuff, but shouldn't be too much. Um, incidentally, uh, if you're ever, ever feeling depressed, look up uh, internet pirate photos. Easy way to cheer yourself up. These things are hilarious. Um, cool. Okay, so something about boats. Docker, right? Uh, it's clipped off a little bit at the bottom here. Ah, oh, that sucks. Anyway, um, so uh, Docker repo, uh, to give you an idea of how popular it is, uh, why you should care about Docker, basically, um, it's popular. Uh, to demonstrate this, I get this incredibly scientific GitHub stars to contributors ratio. It's about 22, clipped off at the end. Um, so you can see lots of stars. This thing's really popular uh, in comparison with some other uh, things here, where it's uh, 3,100 versus infinite contributors on the Linux repo, apparently. So it says, oh shit, at the bottom. Um, jokes are great when you explain them. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, so it's not even in the same league as some other repositories or in the same 20,000 leagues, for example, um, but it's still lots of fun. Uh, these are all the slides I'll bust through. There's all marketing stats, it's boring. Um, Docker, lots of people are using it. Uh, 1.4 Docker image, uh, 1.4 billion Docker image hub pools. Uh, Docker's getting lots of adoption. Um, yeah, so we'll skip through this nice and quick. Um, it's not just some latent infatuation with naval workers, there's actually something about Docker happening recently. Uh, so these stats here are kind of interesting. Uh, they're from Datadog, which is a monitoring company. They did a review in 2015, I think the data's from August 2015, uh, where they reviewed 7,000 customers uh, and they, uh, they looked at current adoption of Docker. Um, so yeah, they saw in one year 5x growth of customers adopting Docker, uh, about 6%, so it's low but rapidly growing. Um, enterprise first, this is really interesting. The larger you are, the more likely you are to adopt Docker, um, which kind of suggests there's some challenging problem around ops that people are just struggling to keep their heads above water. Um, yeah, uh, here are some of the small startups that are using, uh, using Docker, it's getting lots of adoption. These are all the people who you know, publicly admitted it. Um, two thirds of the people who use Docker adopt it. Uh, so they try it out and then they end up usually jumping on it. Um, I think it's most within 30 days of initial test. Um, uh, five months later, they're usually tripling the amount that they use in production. Uh, on average, they have, oh, median, sorry, they have four uh, containers per host. The time to live is three days from an attacker point of view. Super interesting for persistence. If I compromise a box, I can't just sit on it for ages. I've got to find other ways of establishing persistence because that box will die in three days. Um, uh, anyone here for, heard of Phoenix infrastructure? Yar? One, okay, the other person who works at ThoughtWorks, I'm not surprised. Um, yeah, so Phoenix infrastructure is super cool stuff, but yeah, routinely killing your infrastructure. So it's awesome that Docker's sort of leading towards this. Um, of the people, the, two, the one third that didn't adopt, the reason why is usually 53%, the leading case is security, which is interesting. Um, so Docker, 
there's something in the water. That, that's the big like marketing stuff. So we went through that in the lightning ray. Um, yeah, it, it's it's popular and scanning more ten, uh, momentum. Oh boy, I'll stop giving you lots of uh, marketing stats. Um, if you didn't listen to any of that, it's popular, it's growing fast, um, uh, it's used by big companies, and the case in which they're using it, there's multi-tenancy and short lived. That's that's all you really need to know about what it's actually doing. Hopefully, that helps you fathom why you're interested. Um, what is Okay, so I promise I won't read off slides for the most part, but this is actually a really good description of Docker. Um, so Docker and containerization more generally is a technology which allows applications where database, app server, etc., to be run abstracted from and in some isolation from the underlying OS. Uh, Docker service can launch multiple containers uh, regardless of the underlying Linux distro. You can have a bunch of containers on Fedora, you can have CentOS on RHEL, Cats and dogs, mass hysteria. Does anyone know where that quote is from? <laughs> Ghostbusters, yeah, awesome. Big, good job, yeah. Um, sweet. So what is Docker? Uh, so it's also worth noting that Docker is more than just the Docker daemon itself, which is this thing. Um, there's also Docker machine, which is automated Docker provisioning. Uh, so here you can use that to spin up machines uh, on your local uh, machine. You can use it to spin up on in pretty much any of the major cloud providers or any virtualization stack that you can think of. Uh, Docker Machine is a tool that allows you to do that. Um, there's also Docker Compose, which is dependency building, which allows you to include other Docker images and other dependencies to create images which then get deployed. Um, you can use Docker Registry. So in the same way, GitHub, you can have push pull from Docker Registry as a hosted hub.docker.com or you can have your own internally trusted registry where you host it yourself on prem. Uh, there's Docker Swarm, where you have a single virtualized instance that you talk to that then manages a swarm on your behalf. Um, then there's the cloud, uh, Docker Cloud, uh, a hosted GUI where they kind of abstract things, a lot of this previous stuff into uh, stacks, services, and nodes. And that meaning doesn't mean too much. I haven't used this too much. Um, but then there's Docker Data Center, which is an on-prem version of Docker Cloud as well. Um, really, the takeaway from this is they're really going overboard with a lot of the services. If you don't laugh, I'm just going to tell more puns. Um, they've really adopted, the thing that I like about all this stuff is that they've adopted the Unix philosophy of doing one thing well per service, and so they're really fragmenting out. Um, but a lot of people think about Docker as this singular uh, containerization service when it's really this whole ecosystem that allows devs to build, ship, and do the ops for a variety of services uh, and distributed applications. For the purpose of this, however, I will be focusing just on Docker Engine from here on. So when I say Docker, I just mean the Docker Engine sign of stuff. Um, so let's set sail. Um, really, there's three things that the Docker Engine cares about. There's images, there's registries, and containers. Uh, so images are the read-only templates. Pretty similar if you're already familiar with virtualization. Um, so you can have Ubuntu with, for example, an Apache with an application on install. Uh, you build that from a Docker file, you can update the images. Um, Docker registries, these are the distribution con components. So these can be self-hosted, these can be on the crowd. Excuse me. You can push, you can pull from the registries. Uh, then there are Docker containers, and this is actually the kind of like initialized version of an image. This is what actually runs. Uh, so these are created from the Docker image. Um, and yeah, they hold everything that needs to run the application. So Docker containers can be run, started, stopped, etc. cetera. Um, few semantics. Um, so the analogy that I like, because I really like analogies, um, is it's kind of like an apartment building. If you imagine what you want in an apartment building, you kind of want you know, resource management. You want to make sure that you know, your neighbor can't turn on all the hot water and make sure that you can't have a hot shower anymore. You want some consideration on that. Uh, you want your stuff to be isolated, right? If I'm leading, leading my stuff in my apartment, I don't want my neighbor to be able to come and grab my stuff. Uh, I want some little security, right? In the apartment building, I want there to be like, you know, an alarm system, a fire uh, system. I want there to be cameras looking after my stuff. Um, and in a fancy building, I want a concierge, or at least I want like a building manager sitting down, like who knows that like, you know, the trash will routinely get taken out, right? So how does that compare with Docker? kind of the same, right? I don't want one container to be able to use up all the processes, the IOPS, the memory, whatever, of my host machine. I don't want one container to be, access, to be able to access another container. Um, I want some security considerations, which I'll elaborate on in a little bit. Um, and I want like some tooling to make all this stuff easy to manage. 
Um, and they've actually been really smart about how they've used this in their visual design, because instead of apartment buildings, they've gone with containers, um, which is the obvious analogy here. Um, and suddenly, if anyone doesn't know the history of containers, the big metal box things, actually really fascinating. A uh, dude called Malcolm McLean in the 1950s, he owned a big trucking fleet in the South of America. Uh, he wanted to standardize the size of this so that it was easier for him to get his stuff off of his trucks and onto ships. Um, as a result, I think uh, it reduced the freight of cost by 90%, which allowed for mass globalization and cheap t-shirts from China. Um, nowadays, there's 17 million big metal boxes on the planet floating around uh, and doing 200 million trips each year. Uh, and incidentally, fun fact, 10K of them just randomly get lost at sea. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. Um, also, I, I think I've poisoned my Google algorithm so much that now I can't search Docker to find anything actually related to shipping unless I use the word Steve Door. If you didn't know the word Steve Door, today you learned. Um, cool. So, like, when would you actually use these things? Um, so, when you want to, you know, have applications that are you know, like, you know, isolated, disposable, and you want builds that are standardized, repeatable, and fast. Does that sound familiar to anyone? It's probably a case where you want microservices. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted an excuse to use this gig, so yeah. Um, great. Okay. Sure, can we get some breaks? So this was for SecurityCon. I got three puns on one slide. That was mainly why I did it. Um, so let's look into like some of the ways that this stuff can go wrong. Okay. So uh, going a little bit deeper, um, you kind of need to know some of the internals of how this stuff works. Um, so when we're focusing on Docker engine, really it's worthwhile breaking it up into a couple of separate things, because it actually adheres to a client and server model of the client and daemon, really. Um, so they can run on the same system, uh, or your client can talk for a remote daemon or whatever you like. Um, so the client is the primary interface for the daemon. Uh, it's tasked with accepting commands, uh, then communicating back and forth. Uh, say, for example, if I want an image pushed up to the hub, that's the concern of the client. Um, the daemon itself is what runs on the host, uh, and that's what uh, all the you know all the local or the, the remote. Um, and you don't normally interact with that directly. I say normally because hey, security. Um, uh, and interestingly. And this is actually one of the things that has been screwed up in my slides since the last presentation. Previously, that had to be run as root because it's doing system calls. Uh, Jesse Frazzle, one of the core devs, awesome, awesome person, uh, she just released something where, hey, Docker doesn't need to run as root anymore. And I haven't had the time to properly dig into it. So I'm a liar and a fraud. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to run as root. Um, let me dig into that some more. Um, but yeah, uh, previously, continue on as if you had to run this stuff as root. Um, so how do they talk? Uh, so they talk to each other using sockets. Um, sockets, if you're not familiar, general ways to speak you know, to other programs. You can expand it into other scripters, probably not important. Um, or you can use a RESTful API. Um, one of the first hilarious things I found is that you can turn HTTPS off with one flag. So you can have syscalls over plain HTTP, FYI. Um, these are the things that just scream to me as terrible ideas, but it's a, yeah, it's a one flag thing to change. Um, uh, how do you tell your client which daemon you want to talk to? Um, so probably the first icky thing you, you'll come across is that they blindly ask you to eval stuff. Um, maybe I'm a security curmudgeon and I'm just grumpy about stuff. Eval is one of the things I just regex for and when I'm doing a code review. And if I find eval in your code base, you're probably going to fail a security review. I, like, I, I, like, it'll give me enough reason to actually sit down and look in some more. Um, in this case, the output of Docker Machine End is just a bunch of these things here, right? So it's fine. Uh, and I looked into the source, and it's, it's actually perfectly legit. You can't really poison like uh, the Docker cert path or any of those values. They're all got proper validation. Um, but blindly evaling stuff, just mm, nasty. Um, so uh, separately, if any pen testers are in the audience, as soon as you get on a box, uh, look for nvars. There'll be a lot of interesting info about uh, where, um, where different remotes are um, and where the certs sit. Um, so what does this thing actually look like? Uh, so you're all, I'll assume you're familiar with virtualization generally. Um, Docker kind of just dedupes the OS in a really simple way. Um, so uh, you can do this with virtualization in fairness as well, um, but it also isolates the binaries and libraries that you need for each app and kind of just contains it into one little small thingy. 
Um, and so you only pull down what's needed. So it drastically reduces image sizes, um, which is, yeah, a lot more cost effective, both in terms of cache, but also you know, like CPU, IOPS, and all that stuff. Uh, it gives you more flexibility to move these things around. Um, so threat modeling, what can go wrong with this stuff? Uh, so yeah, which containers are running, right? Like as an attacker, these are the questions that I ask myself when I'm looking at this. Um, what processes are each running, right? Can I get a PS aux on a different box? Uh, which files are used by the different one? Uh, what are their network stacks, their host names? Um, are they doing inter-process communication? Like are they writing to areas that I can screw around? Can I poke at their memory? Um, separately, there's container to host. Uh, can I, like, can I get, if I have root on the container, does that mean that I have root on the host? Uh, what syscalls can I make from within? Like, is there a complete open syscall or is there a limited subset? Um, are the resource limits obeyed? Can I use all the hot water? Um, can this container access the file system? Is there isolation? And there's slightly different uh, ways to do isolation. Um, I'll, I'll dig into some of the protections they've put in. Um, namespacing is one of them, the, the big one that came in Docker 1.10. Um, and this is kind of a big catch-all because I didn't have a better image for it, but that's a mushroom cloud. So the cloud, get it? Yeah, I haven't given you enough puns, so I threw that one in. Um, yeah, so that's like generally like cloud considerations in deploying Docker. So attacks on Docker Hub, Docker Cloud, like you know, is, you know, GitHub went down the other day, is, is Docker Cloud going down the other day? Uh, is Docker Hub going down a concern? Uh, but also like OWASP top 10 in those, uh, like XSS on Docker Hub and so on. Um, can you distribute bad images? Um, incidentally, there was a really interesting uh, thing that I've got a slide on later, so I won't talk about it now. Um, yeah, distribution can, like, when I'm pulling down images, if I'm pulling them over HTTP, how do I actually know the image that I'm getting is that? This is kind of a broad catch-all, which isn't super nice. Uh, but noobs, if I've really, really, like, reduced the barriers to entry of this thing, and anyone can do it, maybe people will make some terrible decisions and just spin up some instances without, you know, all the usual security precautions, all the things that more experienced people might consider. Um, so how, how do you manage these possible things that can go wrong? Um, or more generally, like here's a, a short version of here are some of the whacks that I found so far. Um, default on Mac, user star mount. Um, I don't know if this is of interest to anyone, but by default, Docker boot to Docker mounts all your SSH keys. So uh, if I get a compromised image and I can escape out of that, the daemon that's running on your host uh, has visibility of all that stuff. Um, yeah. Um, uh, malicious images, that was the point. Uh, so uh, someone did research into it. Are there any malicious, malicious images on Docker Hub? And apparently over 30% of the official, so when we say official, we're talking like Canonical, Debian, Red Hat, like people who should definitely have good images. Apparently they had high priority VOMs uh, for the security geeks, CVSS 7 and above. Uh, like bug wise, we're talking like shell shock, heart bleed. These are the images, that, and that was a while ago, right? And that was a big problem because it was like, oh, anyone can publish this stuff, but that was the case. Thankfully, I'll talk about some of the improvements in a bit. Um, the one flag disables, like uh, dash dash privileged, uh, literally turns off all security options that you could possibly have. TLS, as I mentioned, HTTP uh, to make sensitive system calls, what? Um, a valid Docker stuff, as I mentioned. Uh, plain text credentials, this is just a personal gripe. I hate plain text credentials, but I see it everywhere that I go. Uh, if you're a pen tester looking at stuff, look in the Docker file, there's probably some plain text credits there. Uh, this is an actual quote that I've had from someone not at my work. Um, <laughs> in the Docker file, where else would I put credentials? Um, yeah, this is uh, the, the dash dash privilege option. Um, I think from the Red Hat blog, it says the dash dash privilege option turns off almost all the security used to confine one container from others in the host. So namespacing, C groups, and some of the stuff I'll go to all get turned off with one flag. Um, these are some of the reasons why I look at it and go, hmm, maybe not so much. Uh, some of the history of the VOM, so how do we stack up against the threat modeling exercise that we did before? Um, what's actually gone wrong in Dockerland and what do they know? Um, so the first one is distribution of images. Uh, the second one there, again, distribution of images. Third was a file system privesc, so from inside a container, you could use that to break out. Um, the fourth was PID namespacing, so you got, again, information about the host, breaking the isolation. Fifth, file system privesc. Sixth, file system privesc. So with all of those ways to break out of Docker or find, yeah, the, the, the containerization component was compromised. 
as a personal uh, thing, uh, this one here I've been playing with locally and trying to replicate it. Um, I think it has something to do with symlinking with dev null while it boots, because that's just causes some a bunch of funky behavior. Um, big call to action. If anyone's super interested in this, please hit me up. Uh, I play with this stuff in my own free time, and I'd love your help if you, if you find it interesting. Um, so uh, again, deep dive going even deeper into some of the things that Docker's actually done really well. Um, so uh, Docker's this new and cutting edge technology, right? It's based off all of this hip startup San Francisco tech that's never been seen before, um, especially this one, which is brand new. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, true uh, operation that changes the apparent root directory from the current uh, running process in Android's children. Uh, it's been around since 1979, I think Unix 4, or like some crazy old stuff, right? Um, you may have used it if you had to install Arch Linux. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, it turns out this wasn't proper isolation, though. Uh, in the early versions, it was easy to circumvent that by just like cd dot dot slash, and then you're back out. That's, that's true. It's, it's evolved since then, but it really wasn't built for the purpose of isolation. Um, next up, uh, FreeBSD Jails, uh, similar sort of concept. Uh, 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 FreeBSD 4.0 in 2000. Uh, Solara Zones, OpenVZ, 2005. Uh, Google's attempt at uh, let me contain that for you, generally between 2006 and 2013. Um, Google, everything at Google runs in a container. Every time you go to uh, Gmail, Drive, Search, YouTube, any of that stuff, that runs its own isolated container. So containers is not a brand new thing. Docker is still kind of newish, but containers have been running for a while. Um, I think the, the fun stat there is two billion containers a week are spun up at Google. That's 3,300 a second, 24-7. Crazy. Um, LXC uh, 2008, which was one of the like Linux uh, containerization tech, which was one of the uh, predecessors of, of Docker. And finally, Docker in 2013. Um, I'm a bit of a white paper geek, so I like reading this stuff. Um, that's clipped off, so I'll, I'll share the slides on the group afterwards. Um, but if you're interested at all in like the white paper history behind this stuff, I really recommend reading them. Um, they're pretty interesting. Um, the point here, I guess, is that this stuff isn't new. Um, we've actually known a long history of all the considerations, like the different attempts at this sort of stuff. And so some of the internals and the fundamentals behind it, there's actually some really solid bases upon which we can start securing this stuff. Um, so what, what do they do kind of awesome? Um, so going back to the apartment model that we mentioned before, there's the resource man management, the stuff isolation, general security catch-all, uh, and tooling and CLI. Um, so stepping through, um, what do they do well? Um, so by design, the kernel couldn't see everything. How do you stop that from happening is something called namespaces. Um, and namespaces are intentionally there to make global resources reduced, uh, appear to be reduced in scope. Um, and so there's a few different ways they can do that. Uh, so there's file system namespacing. Um, so you know, uh, allow a container to think that it, it can't see other, uh, uh, part, which is, uh, other parts of the file system, similar to true. Um, Process ID uh, isolation, um, to think that, uh, so these processes aren't visible to, to uh, different containers. Um, uh, time sharing, host names, uh, network namespaces, um, different IP address, different network stack. I think this point's actually not quite correct because Docker spins up completely separate network stacks, but ignore that. Um, IPC, uh, shared areas of memory, um, and user namespacing. So if I start a machine as Frenchie, um, but inside the container, it thinks that I'm root. Um, that was something that was introduced in Docker 1.10. Um, so it's clipped off at the bottom, but you can kind of see the little blue whale there in stuff isolation. So by design, namespaces isolate. Um, and so Docker uses namespaces in a lot of ways. Um, C groups, uh, Linux control groups, which are explicitly there to put restrictions on how much memory, CPU, IOPS, etc. cetera. Uh, by design, they manage resources. They fit in the manage resources box. Um, Libcap. Uh, so naively, I kind of assumed that once you were root, that was it. You could do a whole bunch of everything. Um, but it, the permissions kind of break down specifically. There, there's some things you can do and some things you can't. And that's managed by Libcap, Linux capabilities. Um, so there's things like in Docker, SSH servers, uh, you don't, uh, SSH services, turning it off on and off, um, cron services, uh, file system mount and unmount. All of this stuff by default is turned off after boot because you don't need it. 
And so libcap sort of says, okay, cool, even if you got root, you probably couldn't re-enable this stuff, which is kind of interesting. Um, this is without the dash dash privilege option. If you put that on, all this stuff goes out the window, but there's some good stuff where they kind of turn off the things that you probably don't want people doing after boot anyway. Um, so they turned off. Um, set comp, um, uh, whitelist restriction on which syscalls are possible. Um, so there's a total list, I think, of like 300 different syscalls and they're restricted down by, you know, to 260. So it's not everything, but even if I was able to get like a buffer overflow, I couldn't necessarily <coughs> cause like, okay, cool, like, I, like I'll just inject this thing that starts calling out to different areas of memory or something because, um, yeah, there's a whitelist of which process, uh, which syscalls I'm actually allowed to, to do. Um, uh, I haven't actually looked at which syscalls are disabled because I was like, okay, great, they're, they're doing that. Um, yeah, uh, and there's a default whitelisting approach, which is great. Um, if it tries to make an unauthorized syscall, then it just sig kills the process, which is good from a defense point of view. Um, Linux security modules, If is anyone familiar with SE Linux? Has anyone turned off SE Linux? <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> Um, so Linux security modules, they're basically this mandatory access control system. Uh, it's a completely separate talk, but I'll actually go through it really quickly because I think it's worthwhile. Um, but it, it explicitly defines a relationship between processes, uh, files, um, and a bunch of other stuff. So yeah, the process types, object types, you can define the relationship, say allow cat to equal food, example, allow dog to equal dog food, um, and then the kernel enforces restrictions around if the cat tries to eat the dog food, no bad thing. Um, uh, yeah, so if yeah, a Ruby process tries to access the Ruby logs, great, but if a Python process tries to access it, no, you get, you're not allowed. Um, uh, completely separate tech to Docker, but Docker makes it really easy to adopt these things because uh, it just turns these things on by default um, in the actual Docker daemon itself. The part that I geek out on is making sure that the images that we build have L uh, Linux security modules turned on by default. Um, yeah, if you're not familiar, check this stuff out, but by design it's basically security. Um, the noobs, general catch-all, I'm running out of a bit of time, but uh, security should be part of the platform, the quote from Diego Manica, the security lead, um, and there's a few different considerations. So the CIS benchmarks are a standard, which are actually pretty easily to audit, like there's automated scripts that test against that, which is what the bench, Claire, and Linus are, so they hold you accountable against the CIS benchmarks in terms of best in class, what should your images look like. Um, NCC, uh, security, well-known consulting, they released a hardening guide, um, which is actually really consumable, uh, but it's like an absolute Bible at like 122 pages. Uh, so security geeks read that, but everyone else just run Bench, Clare, and Lin or, or Linus. They're just easy scanners. Um, and uh, there's also um, some scanning on Docker Hub as well. So the 30% images that we talked about before, there's people scanning Docker Hub, um, the Docker Notary or Docker Nautilus project, um, where they started scanning anything you upload to Docker Hub, they'll look at it and give you a once over and go, hey, kind of looks dodgy. You don't want to patch that. Um, it, it makes it easy to be secure. Um, if you're taking photos, I'll, I'll share this stuff around afterwards. Um, yeah, uh, it, I, I grabbed before that it's easy to turn security features off, but by default, if you take it out of the box, it's actually not that bad. Um, bad images, as I mentioned, no really trust. Overall, how does it stack up? Um, looks like they're having a whale of a time. They do pretty well. Um, I'll give you a quick demo of something fun that it's possible to do in Docker, but I'm conscious that I'm running out of time. Um, Andrew, feel free to come grab me whenever. Uh, I'll move it up there. So this is one of the fun things that you can do. Uh, that's yeah, it's terrible. Really. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah? No? Eh? Okay, yeah, sorry, the rest is kind of funky. Um, basically, I'm just running Docker. You can see all the different standard commands there. Uh, Docker info, so I get some info about the host itself. Uh, it's just totally not going to work. Um, but basically, I'm pulling in nmap. Nmap's a network scanning tool that I use a lot. I show that nmap is not available in the host. No. Demo fail. I did not bless the Poseidon. Uh, I go. Anyway, um, basically, instead of Yeah, um, instead of Poseidon's blessing, I got Poseidon's kiss in that case. If you don't know what Poseidon's kiss means, don't Google it. Um, yeah, so basically I ran nmap inside of a Docker instance, inside of a Docker instance on my host, because why the fuck not? Um, when you turn off to, uh, when you turn off the dash dash privilege option, you can 
run them. It turns off all the security features. There's some weird and fucking stuff. If you actually did this in fraud, you'd be crazy. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Docker replace my day. Um, big thanks to these people with the help. Thank you. Um, um, oh, and uh, if you thought this was the last of the puns, absolutely not a chance. Um, there's a lot of the puns that I used. Any questions? <laughs> Have I got time for questions or? Yeah? Excellent. Um, just um, what are the security implications of reusing terminated containers? Reusing terminated containers? Yeah, so you run a container yep. and terminate it, it's still in the ground. It's dead. Um, you recreate from the image. Uh, yeah, you can restart them. Um, yeah, I guess in the case I've been using, I'll just be able like, to kill it and rebuild. Um, uh, like it'd be the same as reusing any box, I guess. Um, Is there any? Uh, like, well, if you've, it, yeah, I like I I use Docker in a sense where like I will routinely kill, routinely kill and rebuild. Um, I don't. I mean, so, has anyone got a real reason why you'd want to not kill your Docker images? And I don't know. Like, you, you don't want persistence, right? So you would kill it and but yeah. Yeah. The other is um, Docker is there on um, what about, well, what's, what do you see as a general use case for Docker is there on a, on a running or a terminated container or a, um, uh, a use case for Docker uh, Personally, I use Docker exec just to test stuff out. Like, there's a, oh, right, I want to see how this runs. Um, I don't know if there's like a Lambda ish case where you'd actually want to. Run these things reasonably, but no, it's more like a. It's a nice. It's 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 for me. It feels like syntactic sugar. It's like a, oh yeah, here we'll give you this thing. You can turn it on, run it, and then it exits. Um, I don't know. Like it, it, you wouldn't want to manage a swarm or anything like that, where it's just like each instance only runs one. Like maybe for novelty, that'd be fun. But no, I, I don't think you'd actually want to use that stuff properly in prod. Again, with all this stuff, as I said, it was a comedy routine as opposed to anything that's technically informative. So please prove me wrong if anyone knows the right answer. You're right, I didn't. Um, and I think in general, like, it should be completely abstracted away from the host OS. I, in general, is, you know, do I want to use Docker as a potential dev? Yes. Do I care about the underlying OS? Not necessarily. If you need to run it, yeah, sure, great. Uh, would I invest in it personally? Uh, I'm not much of a Windows geek, um, so I wouldn't do it, but that's more of like a Windows thing as opposed to that. I, I think it's interesting, yeah. Like, does anyone run Docker on Windows? Cool. There's some people, yeah. Maybe we'll talk to Chris. Oh, no, it's not Chris. Windows, Phil. Windows, you wouldn't recommend Cool. Yep. More questions? Yep. Uh, I've got one over here. I'll come back. Yep. You can do that, yeah. Um, so the. The C group stuff will do some level of management underneath to make it look not too crazy, but yeah, when you spin them up, you definitely can explicitly manage this stuff. Um, yeah. Is there any uh, wind on the Yeah, I think memory is usually the limiting factor. What actually is it in the How many times can you type it? I don't know. I guess, but you can run them. It's just it's, it's a terrible idea to do it. Yep. It depends on your underlying applications. Um, if your application is RAM intensive, then RAM is probably going to be a limiting factor. I'm going to assume generally, like RAM is probably the first thing to tap out, I think, off the top of my head, but I'm certainly not authoritative on that. Um, uh, but like the underlying hardware, the, the good thing is like you can move one effect, like one image between different hosts and run it on. So the underlying old, uh, hardware shouldn't matter so much. Um, I think there was recently like a one million container project run by Mesosphere or something where they wanted to spin up a million containers or something ridiculous in a short time frame. Um, and they did that by distributing obviously across multiple hosts. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if I'm properly answering the question, but um, yeah, I think it depends on 
but yeah, I mentioned big data stuff. Uh, you take this question from the people of the container on uh, uh, transmitting container on seems Yep. Is that, uh, is that likely to go to run this morning? That's the idea. Yep. So run on so cat, cat Yep. Animals? Yep. Yep. Cats and dogs living together, all that stuff. Yeah. Shouldn't matter. Except for the window. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, I'm interested to hear why you think that's a terrible idea. Um, but yeah, like, you, you could explicitly define a Docker file. Build for that, and then the Docker daemon. The Docker daemon that actually has to talk to the underlying OS is, is different, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Docker images themselves should have a static API that's portable, I believe. Um, yeah, you mentioned an average of like four containers per host. Yep. How does that usually come about? That like the doc compose is running multiple containers? Is that like something like the like, container service? So that was the stat from Datadog, and that was just what they saw. Um, it's still an explicit choice. You can run as many as you want to type on one host. I just it'll it'll bog after a while. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's just what people are seeing on, on median. I think they use uh, ad usage. Um, but yeah, like you, you could definitely set up distributed environments, and I think that's what Swarm does. Swarm does a lot of that management for you. Just like oh yeah, we'll script them over here. Please. <laughs> Very good point, actually. Um, so, uh, how do I get so many puns? Um, it's actually a complete ruse that ThoughtWorks does any real work. We actually just have large email threads, mainly based around puns. So, I actually did give like an entire Australia, I think, why I'd be like, please give me your naval puns. Um, that's how I got that. Uh, Kubernetes, not referencing that. Like, didn't actually realize Kubernetes was a naval reference until uh, until I started doing this. I was like, oh, and then a couple of people pointed out. It's like I just thought that was a cool word for <laughs> yeah, orchestration. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Hey, I think I've, I've goofed around on stage enough. Uh, I might hand over to the next speaker unless there's anything more. Sweet. All right. Thanks for entertaining me. <laughs>